Hello, this is Dr. Reginald Garman at Word of Faith Love Center. I pray that this message that you are about to hear will renew your mind, bless your soul, and inspire your spirit to love God through your living and to live God through your loving. I pray that you will share this message with someone else and be a blessing. And I hope to see you real soon at a live service right here at Word of Faith Love Center. Amen, amen, amen. What an awesome, awesome God we serve. Amen. Awesome God we serve. That was Nicole McCann that danced that beautiful piece um, today. Wonderful, 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 wonderful time. And I don't know about you, but oh my God, I just got so full just hearing her testimony and how grace brought her through. And I know God is no respecter of persons. That what God did for Nicole, he can also do for you. Amen. I want to just announce to you today that we are still in the blessing business. That God blesses us that we may be a blessing to other people. And so COVID has not stopped ministry from going forward. In fact, we believe that this is our brightest hour, that the church is positioned to make a difference and to shine brighter than it has ever been. When you got so many in the world that are dealing with depression, this is a time for the church to shine. When you got so many that are dealing with transition and have lost loved ones. This is a time for the church to shine. In fact, we had a loss and grief seminar on yesterday and just trying to be a blessing to those that are going through. Um, this month, we're gonna be giving out 150 Thanksgiving baskets and turkeys. And uh, we just wanna be a blessing to the community and so before we announce it on social media and really put the word out there, we want to let our family members know first, those that's joining us by live streaming, if you know someone that will be blessed by a Thanksgiving basket and a turkey, just go to our website and sign up, first come, first serve, and you can sign up at our website, woflovecenter.org. And we want to be a blessing. We have these baskets. We have these turkeys that we're going to distribute. And we're going to be a blessing to our family members and to those that are connected with you. But we're also going to be a blessing to our community. So we want you to sign up today. Just go to the website. And all you have to do is register. We're going to be distributing those baskets and turkeys on November the 20th, November the 20th at 12 o'clock, November the 20th at 12 o'clock, but you must register, you must register so that we can know exactly how many we have that we need to give out on that day, amen, amen. So just thank God, give yourselves a hand for you being able to sow into somebody else's life. And because of your gifts and because of partnerships with other ministries, we're able to be a blessing um, to our community. Also, you heard about the men's mentoring program that we're getting started. I'm so excited about that. And um, that's for young men ages 13 to 18. Young men ages 13 to 18. So if you know someone, you don't have to be a member of Word of Faith Love Center to be a part of any of the ministry that we're offering here because we are a bigger part of the body of Christ, amen? And we just want to be a blessing to so many other people. Well, I'm so glad to be back in the house of the Lord today. Amen, amen. I want to thank Isaiah, uh, young man Isaiah Allums that ministered for me on last Sunday. Last Sunday did a wonderful job talking about what success really is, what success really is. And I, I just thank God for the gift of God that's on that young man's life. And I want to do whatever I can do to help nourish and, and mature and, and develop that gift and allow God to use him in such a wonderful way. You know, he has such a genuine heart. And uh, that's, that's why I just love him and love what God is doing in his life. He, um, he texted me last week, and he said, Pastor, I forgot to tell the people something. 
and uh, he wanted to make sure that I told you what he forgot to put in his sermon. I said, Isaiah, you cutting into my time now. <laughs> but what Isaiah wanted you to know, he talked about putting God first, others second, and self third. And, and so he wanted you to know that even when you have a business, you have to consider that God first, other second, and self third. And so if you have a fashion business, it's one thing to, to make people look good, but why are you doing that? Because everything that we do, we do it for the glory of God. So he, 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 he wanted you all to know that no matter what it is that God has called you to do, always think about how this business or how this ministry can bring glory to God. Even as a fashion designer, you have to think about because you're helping people to look good on the outside, then they will feel better about the God uh, that created them on the inside. And so he wanted you to always keep in mind that God is first, others are second, and self is third. So I think he did a great job redefining what success really is. It's not what the world says success is, but it's what God says success is. Amen? Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles today to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse number 1, and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper today, the Holy Communion. Um, and we are just so grateful to be able to come and gather around the Word of the Lord today. Um, AV people, if you would just put 30 minutes on the clock for me, thank you so much, um, so we can make sure that we partake of the Holy Communion on today. Here in Luke chapter 9, verse number 1, the word of the Lord says this, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. I'm speaking from the subject, think before you hit sin. Think before you hit sin. I, I, I realize, and I really should title this, think before he hit sin. Before he hit sin. We are all sent. We are all called to do something. God has called all of us. In fact, the Bible says in this text that he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority. Then in verse number two, it says he sent them. If God is calling you, God is calling you so he can send you. God is not just calling you for yourself, but he's calling you so that he can send you to somebody else. In fact, there is somebody else that needs your calling. They need your gift. They need your talent. They need whatever God has placed on the inside of you. It's not just for you, but it's for who God has sent you to. So what we have to understand, no matter what it is, whether we're a minister, whether we're in the fivefold ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, or teacher, whether we are a teacher in our education system, whether we're a lawyer, whether we're a doctor, whether we're an engineer, whether you're a mother, whether you're a father, a husband, or a wife, you have been called. You have been called so that you can be sent to somebody else, so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. God will first call you, then he will equip you, then he will send you. That is the order of God. God will call you, and then he will equip you, and then he will send you. Never go anywhere unequipped. 
God would never send you somewhere unequipped. So if God is sending you, that must mean that he has already equipped you for your assignment. Your assignment will always be bigger than what you think you can handle, but you're going to have to learn how to trust the equipment that God has placed on the inside of you. If God sends me somewhere, I know that God has already given me everything that I need need in order to be successful, in order to do what he's called me to do, no matter how big the assignment is, no matter how big the challenge may be, no matter how much I may feel like I'm not qualified for it, he is always qualified for it. He is always qualified whatever he has called you to do because God's will is God's bill. And if God ever tell you to go somewhere, you better go there knowing that you're not going in your own power but you're going there in the power of the Holy Spirit that resides on the inside of you. So you better think about it before you go. You got to think before he hits sin. You got to think if God is sending me, then I realize that he has called me for this and he's going to give me success in whatever he's called me to do. So I just want to let you know about a few things that I want you to think about before he hits sin in your life. Before he hits sins, you got to realize, number one, it is not your will, but God's will. It is not what you want to do. It's what God wants you to do. We are placed here to do God's will. Not my will, but thine will be done. We got to understand that this is God's will for my life. And so other people may not like what you're doing. Other people may think you should be doing something else. But they got to understand this is not something that you chose for yourself. This is something that you discovered of why God created you to be. Your destiny is not a decision. Your destiny is a discovery. You think that you decided this? No, God already decided this for you. This is a discovery. God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He also ordained you to be a prophet. He ordained you to be a teacher. He ordained you to do whatever God has called you to do. You simply have to come and discover it. So many years of your life, you may wander around thinking, why in the world am I here? But that that day that you really come to understand why God created you, that's the day you really come alive because you realize that everything that you've been through, everything that God has put in your life, it has been for this assignment, for this destiny, for this purpose, and you remember all of the hurt and all of the pain, and God took all of it and said, I'm going to use it for my glory. I'm going to use it so you can be a blessing to somebody else. When you finally realize that your living was not in vain, but everything that you've been through in your life, God said, I'm going to take it, I'm going to put my anointing on it, and I'm going to help you to help somebody else. Yeah. Everything you've been through. Why? Because my God said, all things... Every good thing, every bad thing, every pain, every power works together for the good of those that love God and know they are called according to his purpose. His purpose. Not my purpose. I didn't call myself. I heard a calling. I didn't decide to do this. I, I discovered why I was created. Oh my. And when your decision becomes a discovery, you realize I can't take it back. I've come too far now to turn back now. I discovered this why God created me. You become a powerful person when you realize this is why you are here. So when people think you don't belong, you can look at them dead in the eye and say, you don't determine my purpose, Come nor on. do you know my destiny. Come but on. my God told me, this is why I'm here. That's why nobody can run you away from your purpose. Yeah. 
Nobody can talk you out of your purpose. Nobody can discourage you from your purpose because you realize you're not here because of them. You're here because God created you for such a time. Right now, you may not like it, but you gotta accept it. Yes, sir. Not my will, but thine will be done. When you know you're sent, you realize it's him that sent you. Number two, he will not send you alone. You can mess with me if you want to, but I'm not by myself. I got the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. When you realize you're not by yourself, you walk differently. You talk differently. When you realize you got some help, the old folks used to say, I feel my help coming on. Yes, sir. When you get tired sometimes, he will strengthen you. When you get lost, he will direct you. When you get empty, he will fill you. Oh. Tell your neighbor, say, you got help. You got help. You got help. He will never send you alone. That's why Jesus always sent his disciples two by two. That's right. He never sent them alone. He never sent them alone. And I want you to know, I don't know who I'm talking to here today, but you're not alone. Sometimes you feel like you're by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Whenever you say yes to God, God has already spoken to other people that are called to help you. Whenever you say yes, it feels like you're all by yourself. But in the meantime, God has already spoken to somebody else and say, go help so-and-so. I want you to be there for so-and-so. God has already spoken to their heart even before you get there. Sometimes you don't even see your ram in the thicket until you start climbing the mountain. Sometimes you got to climb the mountain by faith and think that you're all by yourself and you'll get to the top of the mountain, look over, and God's got help waiting on you. Where's your help? Your help is waiting on you on your road to destiny. Your help will not be at the starting line. Your help is going to be along the way. I ran on a 5K race about two weeks ago. And I got to the starting line, and I was all by myself. I said, Lord God, I got to run by myself. And I started running, and I found that God had some help along the way. And I needed that help along the way. I needed somebody to encourage me. I needed somebody to give me some water. I needed somebody. And they had cheerleaders along the route of the race. And these were people, they were paid, well, I don't know if they were paid, they were probably volunteers, but they were volunteering to cheer as you ran by them. And they don't realize that they were strategically placed at the place where I felt like stop running and start walking. Yeah. But you never want to walk by somebody that's cheering you on. That's right. So when I saw them cheering, I said, I can't start walking when they are cheering. When you got a cloud of witnesses yeah. that are cheering you on, yeah. how in the world can you give up fighting the good fight of faith when you got mom and them yeah. and grandmama and them praying for you? <laughs> Baby, keep running your race. You're not alone. You're not alone. I hear my mama talking to me sometimes. Yeah. You're not alone. I hear my teachers behind me. I hear my mentors behind me talking to me. You're never alone when God send you, when God send you to do what he's called you to do. You're never alone. Number three, you have the power and authority to do what God wants you to do. You got the power and authority. Say, I had a power and I have the authority. What, what, how, how does that make you feel when you know you got power and authority? How does that make you feel? That makes you feel like, can't anything stop me but me? Uh -huh. If I have the power and the authority, the Greek word is dunamis and isusha. 
it is the power and the authority. See, a police officer, when they go out to do their job, they have the power, which is the Glock, the nine millimeter. That's the power. And then they have a badge. That's the authority. You have the power, which is the Holy Spirit, and you have the authority, which is the name of Jesus. So when you're dealing with situation, sometimes you got to sit the Holy Spirit on them. But other times you just need to go and say, in the name of Jesus, come out. So you have the power and the authority. He said, if you ask anything in my name, that's the authority. What authority? By what authority do you cast out demons? I cast out demons in the name. Paul, I know. <laughs> but who are you? See, whenever we go in places, you have to understand when God sends you somewhere, you have power and authority. When you know you have power and authority, let me show you what happens. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 31. This is what happened when you know you have power and authority. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all what? Filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And then look at what happened when they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with what? Boldness. See, people that are a little timid, uh -oh. Uh -oh. they don't understand they got power and authority. That's right. When you know you got power and authority, you knock doors down. Come on. You bust into rooms. When you know you got power and authority, you don't allow foolishness to happen in your presence. Come on. That's right. When you got power and authority, you're like, as for me and my house we're going to worship the Lord when you know you got power and authority you will speak to the enemy and say listen you have messed with my family long enough get up out of here Satan stop being a wimp and you got all this power and all this authority and you scared to talk to people you got all this power and all this authority, but you allow people to treat you any kind of way. Oh. You got all this power and all this authority, but you allow people to trespass on what belongs oh, to you. Oh. Oh, my. When you know your power and know your authority and know that God sent you, you will go and possess what belongs to you. That's why when you go into your promised land, it's like, listen, y'all got to get out. You got to go because God has given me power and authority, and now I'm going to speak to you with boldness. And when you speak to somebody with boldness, they know that, number one, you believe what you say. Because if you don't believe it, they will not believe it either. Can y'all tell that I believe what I preach? I do. I believe everything come out of my mouth. I believe everything in the word of God. Amen. So when God, and I'm, I'm a, see, I'm real shy by nature, but when I get filled, when I get, when I get full of, when I get fed up with you, <laughs> say, when I get filled, you better watch out because boldness, I'm going to be like, listen, you got to go. I'm tired of your mess. You don't let nobody mistreat you when you got power and authority. You don't let nobody say you don't belong somewhere when you have power and authority. You don't allow people, listen, to take advantage of you when you got power and authority. You have to know when you've been sent. Number four. There will be demonic oppression. There will be demonic oppression. When God sends you, guess what? You're going to come against opposition. But don't worry about that. Why? Because you have what? Yes, sir. Preach it, Dick. Yeah, that's it. Just because 
there is opposition. See, see, here's the problem. We got spoiled. We, we've gotten places too easily. And, and, and God is saying, listen, I need you to understand the bigger your purpose and your destiny, the greater the opposition is going to be in your life. So I don't know if you start crying over opposition, but you really should start praising God because if there's that kind of opposition that's coming your way, then that must mean wherever God is sending you, whatever God is getting ready to do in your life, it must be awfully powerful. And that is the reason why the enemy is trying to discourage you. He's trying to distract you because really the enemy is scared of your purpose. He's scared of your purpose because you don't mess with nobody that's not powerful. You don't mess with nobody that does not have a purpose and a destiny. The enemy is not going to waste his time because you will defeat yourself if you don't know your purpose and your destiny. But the moment you come to understand who you are and whose you are, that's when all hell is getting ready to break loose in your life. Why? Because the enemy now deems you dangerous. You're dangerous now. And that's why the enemy said, I got to distract them. I got to discourage them because I can't stop them. I cannot stop them. There will be opposition. Number five, this is the fifth thing that you got to understand when you're sent. You must do what he instructed. You must do what is instructed. Now, what did Jesus tell the disciples in our text? He said, I want you to go and preach and heal. He sent them, verse 3, to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, right? That's what he told them to do. Now look down at verse number 6. So they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. The worst thing you can do is do the opposite of what God told you to do. You have to do what is instructed. When somebody sends you, do what is instructed. If somebody tells you to pray, don't get up there and sing. See, I come from old school. I come from when, when you didn't do what the pastor told you to do. That's the last time you're going to get in the pulpit. <laughs> I'm old school. So I remember my, my bishop told me, <laughs> he said, if I tell you to pray, you pray. <laughs> Don't be getting up there and say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm led to sing a song. That'd be the last song you sing up in there. <laughs> if I tell you to bring fried chicken, you bring fried chicken. Don't you bring no macaroni and cheese. Why? Because I told somebody else to bring the mac and cheese. See, we mess up the menu when you start doing what you want to do. Do what God called you to do. Somebody else got the mac and cheese. Why are you bringing mac and cheese? Nobody told you to bring mac and cheese. Do what God called you to do. Do what he instructed you to do. Jesus told them to preach and heal. He didn't tell them to prophesy. What did they do? They preached and they healed. They did exactly what Jesus told them to do. And when you start saying, well, you know what? I got there and I was just led to... No, do that means you don't know your assignment before you leave. When you know your assignment, you don't become influenced by external factors. When you know your assignment. That's why when I go to the hospital, I already know my assignment. So when I go to the hospital and I see tubes everywhere, I'm not not affected by external circumstances. Because I know my assignment. I don't care. This is what I'm here for. This is what God called me to do. I know my assignment. You can't allow other people to influence what God instructed you to do. 
do what he tells you to do. Number six, look at, look at verse, look at the next verse. I'm sorry, look at verse number four. Verse number four. What did he say? What did he say in our text? Verse number, um, I'm sorry, verse number three. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff nor bed nor bread or money. He said, don't take anything. He said, don't take anything, okay? Don't take anything. When you're sent, you're going to have to learn how to trust in him. You got to learn how to trust in him when you're sent. Why in the world would God send you somewhere and say, don't take nothing for the journey? No staff, no bag, no bread, no money. Do not have two tunics apiece. Because this journey, you cannot rely on those things that you have obtained. You're going to have to rely on what God is telling you now. See, all these things is what they had obtained, what they already had. But what happens when God calls you to a place where what you had does not help you with where you're going? What happens when you are used to dealing with people one way, but now God is calling you to a new set of people that that kind of stuff don't work with them? And he says, leave all that behind because that worked in the 80s. But where I'm calling you now, I don't want you to take none of that stuff. I'm going to give you what you need when you get there. So that mindset that you had, leave that back there. Because where I'm taking you, I'm going to allow you to possess the mind of Christ. Don't take no money with you. What? I take money wherever I go. But Jesus said, don't take no money. Well, Lord, see, can you imagine what the disciples were thinking? Lord, how we, how we going to eat? Lord, how, where, where we going to stay? Well, how, how we going to survive? See, whenever God sends you someplace, he will always test how much you trust him. This was a trust test. And so God is sending you all somewhere, and I guarantee you, you're going to have to pass the trust test. You got to pass the test to say, hey, are you going to rely on your old ways of doing things? Are you going to say, Lord, here I am. I'm in new waters right now. God, if you don't tell me what to do, what to say, If you don't provide what I need right now, I'm going to fail. But God, all I know is you sent me. God, I'm with somebody now that, ooh, I don't know how to deal with this person. God said, good. Because all you have surrounded yourself with up until this point is people that you know how to deal with and that deals with your mess. Oh my. But now you with somebody that don't drink your Kool-Aid and you finally got to oh be my. something you've oh never my. been. Oh my goodness. You're talking good, sir. So you don't like it very well, so you get rid of that person and say, let me go back to my Kool-Aid. But what you're doing, you're aborting the plan of God because he's sending you to a different place and he wants you to deal with some new people in your life, but you can't deal with new people until you become a new person. 
And when you become a new person, the old people won't even like you anyway. And God will bring new people in your life. Stop taking that old mess with you. Stop taking it with you. Jesus said, leave all that stuff behind. What are you not leaving behind? You keep taking it thinking you need it. Pastor, if I don't cuss people out, people are going to take advantage of me. See, see, that's that ghetto stuff. That's that ghetto stuff. <laughs> I need this mouth, Pastor. This mouth has helped me survive all these years. Let it go. God. I got to start right here. I'm not finished. I got to start right here, though. Whenever God sends you, understand it's his will, not your will. Number two, he will never send you alone. Number three, you have what? Power and authority. Number four, there will be demonic opposition it's okay it's okay don't worry about it when that demon comes like yeah I was expecting you when you go to work tomorrow be like yeah pastor told me you gonna show up today that's all right that's all right I'm ready for you today baby I'm ready for you today number five you must do what instructed, not what somebody else is doing, what God told you to do. When he sent you, do what he told you to do. Make the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> you know why they told you to make the macaroni and cheese? Because you make it so good. That's why uh, so-and-so can't bring the macaroni and cheese because it's all runny. But when you make that mac and cheese, boy, see, when you don't show up for your assignment, then I got to eat somebody else's mac and cheese. And nobody get blessed. messing up the menu <laughs> and number six learn how to trust him preach it preach it learn how to what trust him what you used to do learn how to trust him for something new because where listen I feel it in my spirit where God is taking you now the old stuff won't work the old stuff won't work. That's why when you are being sent, you got to be willing to hear God's voice and say, Lord, if you're telling me to do something new, I'm going to trust you. Going to trust you. Going to trust you. Star, come in. Come here, Star. Come here, Star. Star has recently been elected as councilwoman here in the city of East Point. This is your new councilwoman in East Point, all right? Star, I heard God say, trust him. If we want a new East Point, we got to do new things. Be willing to leave the old in the past and trust them for new stuff. There will be opposition, a lot of opposition. But understand, God has given you power and authority. All right? 
And what God is going to do in you, he'll do through you. Because this is not coincidence that he selected you for this assignment. He called you, he equipped you, and he's sending you. And I want you to know, you got to do what he told you to do, and you must trust him, all right? And I just want to pray over you as you enter into this next assignment. Amen. Yes, yes, I was thinking. Come here, husband. <laughs> he never sends you alone. He never sends you alone, right? So, y'all together. Oh, yes. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the purpose and the destiny that you placed over their lives. And I pray you give her the wisdom and the boldness to be able to speak, oh God, into systems that are not right, to injustices that are not right. God, I pray that she would trust in you, God, and that you would lead her and guide her. And that, Lord, you would give a favor with the citizens and with the government that is established right now. Father, Lord, may they be a sense of unity to come on that board, oh, Father, and with the mayor. I pray, Father, that this city will never, ever be the same again. But, God, may this mark the time of a new beginning. For every residence of East Point, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. That this will be a city, oh Father, low in crime, but high in purpose. God, we thank you, Father, for what you're doing right here in East Point. Now, may you equip your servant here to go before you and to be a representative for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all clap your hands and thank God so much for you. Thank God so much. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Now, at this time, we're going to prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. I have four more things I'm going to share with you next week of what you need to think about before he sins. And the last four I will cover next week. Don't miss next week. Next week, we're also having baptism. Baptism is going to be a wonderful time as we culminate this message. Um, and as we baptize some believers, amen, baptism is a sign that the old has passed away and all things become new. Whenever God does something new in your life, you can show that as a testimony through baptism that the old ways have died and now God has become resurrected in your life. So we're going to have a wonderful time of baptism on next Sunday bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, Lord, as we prepare our hearts right now for the Lord's Supper, we ask that you would search our hearts. And if there's anything in us that's not of you, forgive us. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Help us, O oh Lord, to live a life that is pleasing unto you. Lord, we thank you for grace. We're saved by that grace, God. We have faith in that grace that the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary was more than enough to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we haven't done everything that we know we should do. And for that, God, we ask for forgiveness today. We ask and we repent today. And we ask that you forgive us. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, we renew our faith in you. We do this as a memorial to the gift that you gave to the world the gift of your only begotten Son. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand to your feet, everybody. Oh, what love. Oh, what love. He has. Me, that he will give that he would give his life oh, what love oh what love he 
has. He has for me that He will give. That he will give. He gave His only begotten His Son. Thank you for loving us the way you do. As for me, that you gave your only begotten son. That he would give his love. And when Jesus Christ was gathered together with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which has been broken for you by his stripes. We are healed. Say that with me. By his stripes, I'm healed. Say it again. By his stripes, I'm healed. Say it with conviction. By his stripes, I am healed. Take the bread, which was broken for you. Eat ye all of it in remembrance of him. And after the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents my new testament, my new covenant, my new agreement that you're saved by grace, not by works, but his grace has saved us. In his blood, one drop of Jesus' blood was enough to wash us of all of our sins, both past, present, and future. He said, drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. Amen. Father, Lord, as we leave this place, but never ever from your grace, may your spirit rest, rule, and abide with us. And Lord, we thank you for that love that saved us, that redeemed us, that is with us each and every day. Now, Lord, as you send in us, thank you for being with us. Thank you for empowering us. Thank you for giving us wisdom. Help us to trust you more to be what you called us to be and do what you called us to do. Now, Lord, I pray your divine favor upon your people. I pray, God, you will bless them in the city and bless them in the field. Bless them when they come and bless them when they go. I pray that your favor will surround them like a shield and that, Lord, you will order their steps in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you, God bless you. We'll see you next week.